While you're watching me, there's a pretty good chance that someone in your house, maybe the person right next to you, is scrolling through their phone, laughing at a meme or a video on Instagram. Maybe they've just thrown their phone across the room because of something a friend just posted. And maybe you just looked away from me to check to see how many likes you got on that vacation video. Politicians know you're watching too. Their consultants have one goal, to make sure you only listen to their point of view. But what is social media doing to our culture? What is it doing to our hearts, to our souls? What is this kind of virtual discussion doing to our kindness? That's next on State of Independence. I'm always asked if there are people on the political horizon that I've got my eye on. Principled, caring, women and men with servant hearts. People who are saying and doing things differently. Running away from the pack instead of running with the mob. In other words, leaders. One of the places where I look for new voices is on social media. No, not just the big stars in politics who've got millions of followers, but the ones who have a thousand or two and respond with grace and kindness and gentleness, even when they're attacked. As a Christian, I'm looking for something theologians call Christ-likeness, an attitude that's not based in retaliation or retribution, but the spirit of reconciliation. I think I found someone you should meet. She's driven hundreds of miles from her home and the legislative district she represents in the Mountaineer State. I can't wait for you to meet her. But first, watch this. 46% of Americans are worn out by political posts and social media. 68% say talking about politics online is stressful. 67% say social media makes them realize they have less in common with online friends. But despite exhaustion, Americans can't seem to look away from the conversations giving them the most stress. Republicans post and share Republican content. Democrats post and share Democratic content. Liking, sharing, retweeting, to a seemingly endless silo of their own thoughts. So is the art of persuasion dead? Is politics only about stoking the fire of fans and like-minded voters? Are elections really all about the base, no longer about changing hearts and minds? Is this the cause or the symptom of America's war of incivility? Is there hope? Well, one West Virginia lawmaker is doing her part to change the statistics and challenge the conversation. And her name is Kayla Kessinger, and I'm delighted that she's with me this morning. Kayla, thank you so much for joining me. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. And you and your mom drove from West Virginia to here in Philadelphia? Yes, yes, the Mountain State. We're here uh, for the weekend, <laughs> so exciting. I've never spent that much time in Philadelphia, so I'm excited to get to come to this historic city and get to experience the culture for a little is bit. It, is it at all, from what you've seen so far, what you thought it might be? It's everything I thought it would be and nothing I thought it would be all at the same time. <laughs> I'm excited. We're going to go and uh, check out the Liberty Bell and things yeah. this weekend. So yeah. it's um, as a history buff, this is something that I've looked forward to doing for a long time. Now, you're, you're from, uh, I guess, a, a line of, of coal miners, right? Yes. I always tell people I come from a long line of coal miners and moonshiners. Yeah. So uh, salt <laughs> of the earth people, yeah. you yeah. know. What, what, is moonshine really what, what they say it is? I mean, oh. is it really like a... Have you ever had it? No. <laughs> no I, 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 guess, I guess I'm just showing that I have it, right? Yeah, I no. Be it's funny. I, um, my grandfather, he, he's originally from Kentucky, and um, his family came from West, came to West Virginia, and he and his grandfather had a moonshine steal and always tell me stories about uh, running from the revenue. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's fun. That I, I just joke around and um, I'm proud of where I come from. West Virginia is a beautiful state with, with a lot of really beautiful people. And so yeah. I'm, I'm very lucky and blessed. And your dad's really a pastor and, and also a legislator? So my father is the mayor of my small town. I grew up as a pastor's child. Tell everybody the name of the town. Um, my town is Mount Hope. Okay. Um, interesting little fact is my town um, actually was originally named Egypt. And throughout um, all of the history, the town was changed from the name of Egypt to Mount Hope. Um, our town burned down in 1910 and was completely reconstructed. They call us the Phoenix City because we've been able to reconstruct and rebuild. And um, it's just a, a true testament of 
the West Virginia spirit of people who have been fought and, and fought and, and beaten down and how we've been able to overcome and, and move on in right, life. Right. So now, how much coal mining is still done it, where you live? Sure. So um, I live in the heart of coal country, southern West Virginia. Um, my dad was a coal miner growing up. He was a pastor. He was a coal miner. Um, I always say coal is what put food on my table. And so there's still a lot of coal mining done. Of course, we've seen um, a huge decline in the number of, of coal jobs yeah. in the state through yeah. the last couple of years. Um, and so what do people do when they can't coal mine anymore, when they can't Absolutely. So our state has really worked very hard on getting coal miners retrained. Now, a lot of coal miners are, do not want to be retrained. retrained. They're proud of their heritage. They come from long lines of coal miners. Um, and so a lot of them, they will stick it out and they'll wait and they'll look for those jobs. But we've really worked hard from a legislative perspective to find retraining programs for coal miners who would like to pursue a career in technology or things like that. So yeah, yeah. while coal is still um, coal is still king in yeah. West Virginia, yeah. um, but we're definitely um, we're definitely feeling the hit. And so, what are the challenges that people face in your in your? I mean, uh, obviously. When people don't have work, you know, you see a spike in drug addiction Absolutely. and all kinds of stuff. What, what, what? So you're, you're a le you're, and you're young to be a legislator, <laughs> by the way. I'm 27. So wow. <laughs> wow. I've been in the legislature. I ran for my first election uh, when I was 21. Um, I had actually, I was going to school to be a news broadcaster in, uh, at Regent University, and um, my dad was initially going to run for office, um, and he called me and asked me to come home and help him with his campaign, and I said, absolutely, I um, was going to take this semester by the bug, right? Exactly. Well, yeah. he ended up deciding not to, and through a series of crazy events, I ended up agreeing to run for the House of Delegates very re reluctantly. Um, I'm actually from a district, so I'm a Republican in Southern West Virginia. I'm from a district that hadn't elected a Republican since 1928. Yeah, a lot of Democrats, a lot of Democrats. Yes, yes, conservative we were Democrats. Though, right? Conservative Democrats, Democrats right. labor Democrats who right. are conservative when it comes to social issues. Right. And so um, over 86 years, no Republican leadership, and I got to be part of the historic transition in West Virginia going from you know consistent Democrat leadership from to, for 80 years to, 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 to the change to Republican. Is your dad yeah. a Republican? Too? He is. So he's actually how I got involved in politics. <laughs> um, when I was 12, George W. Bush was running for re-election and my dad was very involved and he would take me to events. The president came um, for a campaign rally to Beckley and I got to go. I stood on the front row and he came down, he shook my hand and in that moment I began to feel this calling to politics. And so from the time I was 13, I went head first into the pro-life movement um, and that the Lord really gave me a burden um, for the sanctity of life and from there uh, I ended up being recruited to run for office and, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so was the campaign a, a mean one? I mean was it was it? You know I have always tried to say I want people to vote for me not against my uh, my opponent. I want people to see something in me that speaks to them that says I want to vote for Kayla not against her opponent. And so I've always tried to maintain positive, um, positive approach to politics and yeah. campaigning. It's not always easy, especially yeah. when other people are saying hurtful things about yeah. you. You want to avenge yourself, so, but so, I'm like, so leave what, it to what, God. What do you do when somebody says something mean about you on social media, when sure. somebody attacks you, and somebody doesn't agree with your position? I mean, you know, it, it, we're, as Christians, we're called to love people, yep. to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. What happens when you come across somebody who has a, a, a position that's, that's, that's opposed to where you stand, sure. and, 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 and they're mean, uh, <laughs> they can be very cruel. You know, they People don't, they can don't be like cruel. where yeah. you stand. They're letting you know that they don't like where you stand. Exactly. How, how, how do you respond? How, how have you learned to, to respond to that? <laughs> well, my initial reaction is, who do they think they are? Right. But then immediately, you know, I have to say, I am supposed to be led by the Spirit, and I have to sort of switch my mindset. I might type out a couple tweets, but then the Spirit's like, you need to delete that right, right now, right, you know. Right. And so I have just taken the approach that I do not have to avenge myself. The Lord does that for me. The Lord is going to fight my battles, um, and while I may have to set, I may have to defend my position or defend um, my values. I'm going to do it from a perspective of the person that has uh, that has a difference in opinion is not my enemy. The Scripture says that um, we don't fight battles against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Yeah, that's right. And so my approach has been. Um, it hasn't always been this way. The Lord has had to convict me <laughs> yeah. um, and has done a work in me. But my approach today is when I see someone who I disagree with or who is even attacking me, I give it to the Lord. And I just say, God, 
I care more about their heart, I care more about their soul than winning this social media argument than, than what they think about me. What they think about me doesn't matter. Where they're gonna spend eternity is where the, is where the priority should be. Yeah, that, well that's a wonderful, wonderful, sweet, thoughtful, kind spirit. That's, that's who we're supposed to be as Christian people. Uh, what do you do? I mean, think of all the, all the, 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 the political arguments that divide us all, all the issues that divide us. You know, you, you early on took a strong stance on the issue of life. Mm -hmm. and, and then there are people who are equally as passionate on the other side who say, you know, I'm pro-choice and, 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 you know, I think it's a woman's right to choose. And, and you're a woman. So, so w when you talk to women who don't agree with you, I mean, how, how, do, how do you handle, what's that conversation look like? Sure, so um, you are right, I've been a woman for 27 years. <laughs> and so this is an argument that I have, um, that I have pretty frequently. I mean, this is an issue that the Lord has really given me a passion for. And so um, when you have a passion for something, you talk about it a lot. And a lot of times that invites uh, um, people to defend their own opinion. And so right. it's sort of been a journey for me. When I first got involved um, in the pro-life movement, I was a very passionate, young, 13-year-old girl. Right. Um, and a lot of times passion can sort of turn into anger toward people who disagree with you. And I remember I had such a passion, such a burden for the unborn um, that I really viewed people who disagreed with me as as the villain, as the enemy. And so I, I began to feel my heart be hardened toward them. And I will never forget, I picked up um, Abby Johnson's book, Unplanned. I, I spent every waking moment of my life when I wasn't in school reading about fetal growth and development, every pro-life group, every pro-life book I could get. And I picked up her book and I started reading it. And immediately the Lord began to convict me. In her book, she talks about how she worked in Planned Parenthood and how she went into Planned Parenthood not to murder babies, but to help women. And my mind began to think and the Lord just immediately began to convict me. And he said, she is not a villain. She is not evil. She has not been, sh she was not shown truth. And so my, my mindset began to shift from, I'm not going to view this, per they're wrong and they are not rooted in truth. So I have to share truth and I have to share it in love. And so the Lord has, has done a work in my heart where when I, view somebody, when I meet somebody who has a difference in opinion or um, disagrees, especially on this issue that can be very, um, that can be very controversial, I approach it by looking at the woman at the well with Jesus. You know, you have the woman at the well um, who is wrong in her thinking. She's wrong in, in the way that she's and living. everybody said, Jesus, don't talk to Absolutely. her. Leave her alone. Her community, right. was, I mean, she literally couldn't go get water when the rest of the people in the community would because of how they treated her and how they demonized her and how they vilified her. She had to hide. And then Jesus comes along and you're right. His disciples are even like, who, who right. is he talking to? Why would he spend his time with her? And Jesus begins to point out her wrong, but he does it with love. And so that's the way that I've always tried to approach it. I haven't always been perfect. <laughs> I'm still working Who on it. Is, exactly. Right? We've all got areas we can grow in. Um, but that's sort of the decision we as believers have to make. Are we going to approach people where that, that we have differences in opinion with? Uh, are we going to be her community or are we going to be Jesus? Are we going to act like Jesus and, and sort of convey that message of love um, yeah. to people? Yeah. How, how about the, the, the area of political ambition? You know, I mean, it, it gets hard. I mean, you, a lot of people go into political life with good intentions, with sure. the intention of, I just want to serve the people in my community and, and, and do, do right by them. Yep. And, and then there is the seduction thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, suddenly people say, well, you know, you could be governor, you could be U.S. senator, you could be a member of U.S. Congress. Yeah. You know, you're a rising star because clearly you're a rising star. How do you deal with who God wants you to be and, 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 and the, the draw of, of, of power? Absolutely. So, you know, I actually think this gets to the root of the problem in politics in general, especially when it comes to Christians who are involved in politics, whether they're running for office or working in campaigns. Um, I think a lot of times our priority is on building our own empires. It's on 
building our, pub our uh, political parties instead of building the kingdom. Um, it's winning this Facebook argument instead of winning souls. And it gets to the underlying issue of what is our motive? Our, is our motive to build ourselves up? Is our motive to build our own kingdoms, to build our own empire, say, hey, look at me, look what I've accomplished, look at what I can do? Or is our motive kingdom focused? Um, because humility doesn't come naturally yeah. to people. Humility is not a natural <laughs> thing. Um, my pastor always says, you never have to teach a kid to say mine. <laughs> like kids just say <laughs> it, right. you know, they know they what is mine, it's mine, mine. 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 exactly. Right. Right. And so it's something that is learned that the Lord, that the Lord really has to work on us <laughs> for. And so I'm learning um, every single day that you have to approach, when the Lord gives us gifts, we have to be proud of those gifts and we use those gifts, but we should never get it to the point where we're saying, I'm going to build my empire. There, there's a quote that I read that I love, and it says, um, stop building your own empire and start digging wells. And I think that is so powerful because when we think about the significance of wells, um, why do people dig wells? It's to get water. And what do we know about God? It's that from Him flows streams of living water. And if we want people to truly, you know, we talk about wanting to change people's minds. We can do that all day long. I can try to change your mind, but I can never change your heart. Right. Only God can change hearts. And when we want true transformation, that comes from, ch from changed hearts, not changed minds. Oh, that's so wonderfully said. Wonderfully said. I, uh, it would be a blessing if uh, there were more uh, servant leaders uh, in the ranks of elected officials uh, and people who weren't uh, easily um, swayed by the, the lure of, of, of pure power. Uh, your heart's in the right place and it's wonderful. You don't see too many people. That's why we have you on today. We think you're a leader uh, and, and you're somebody to lift up for other people to see so they can follow your example uh, and because they can see the Christ in you. Uh, we've got lots of people who are elected officials who, who you know, have in their profile, you know, I'm a Christian, you know, I belong to some church somewhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, people have to see Christ in us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there's so few people in whom you can see Christ. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and our words betray us, oh, okay. you know. So, so if you say you're a Christian and you, you, you speak meanly mm -hmm. to people and you are not kind in, in, yeah. your, in your deportment, if if you don't care about others like you care about yourself, mm -hmm. that, that tells who you really serve. So it's a blessing when you have somebody who's a legislator, a, as you are, a delegate, a rising star, who's not full of themselves, who, who knows that they're just fulfilling God's purpose for their life by their service in, in government. And, and that's a blessing. And, and, and it's, it's a, an example for us to hold up for everybody to see. So I thank God for what you're doing, Kayla. Um, uh, I, I want to talk about more with you, uh, and, and we're going to do that. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the, the challenges of drug addiction because, mm -hmm. you know, when people uh, see no future for themselves, uh, it, it, they, they sometimes turn to, to drugs or to alcohol, mm -hmm. and that, that may be an issue in your district where you are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to kind of chat with you, just figure out how you, how you fight it, how do you encourage people who are discouraged. Oh, absolutely. You know, this is an issue that I'm very passionate about. You know. West Virginia has been ravaged by the drug epidemic. We talked earlier about um, the decline in coal production. And what happens when people lose their job is they, they begin to look for satisfaction somewhere else. And so many people have turned to drugs in West Virginia. And for a very long time, we have approached this from a perspective of we need to cure the addict. The government needs to cure the addict. And I think it's, it takes a shift in our mindset toward people who are struggling with an addiction. Nobody calls us by our sin. We, why would we refer to somebody who is struggling with an addiction as an addict? Because that's not who they are. They are someone who it was created in the, same, in the image of the same God that you and I were created in. The same God who breathed the breath of life into our lungs, breathed the breath of life into theirs. And so when we approach it from this position of only God can cure this underlying disease, you know, government can fix a lot of the symptoms. You know, we can take away the pain, we can take away maybe the desire, but until God is able to dig that out, um, until the church fulfills its role as, as, men and women of, as men and women of God who are supposed to be loving these men and women, um, we can never truly see the, the, the sunrise on, the, on this issue in West Virginia. Yeah. 
You know, well, brothers and sisters, stay with us. We'll be right back, but we're talking with Kayla Kessinger, a delegate from the state of West Virginia. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. God bless you. Thank you for, for being with us today. This is such an exciting time, such an exciting time because we're talking with uh, the great delegate from West Virginia, Kayla Kessinger, and she's somebody who started out as an activist and, uh, and still is, but she has a servant's heart and uh, it's not something you see uh, as often as you might like in, in public life for people who are elected to political office. So we're just delighted to have her here today. So Kayla, we're back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I, I love your servant's heart. Um, here's a question for you, because um, so many of us think to ourselves, if I only knew then what I know now, mm. I might have done it differently. If you were able to go back in time and talk to the 15-year-old, and you talked a little bit about mm. the 13-year-old Kayla who was yeah. very passionate, but if you could go back in time and talk to the 15-year-old Kayla Kessinger, um, what would you tell her? What would you say to her um, to prepare for this moment? <laughs> sure. Knowing if you knew that this is where you were going to be, sure. what would you say to her? There's a lot of things I'd probably say to 15-year-old Kayla, but um, when we talk about this, I think I would probably tell myself, spend less time trying to keep the peace and more time trying to make peace. I think a lot of times when we talk about making peace or waging peace, we think it's keep the peace. It's right. just, we don't wanna really start a conversation. We don't wanna rock the boat. But when we talk about making peace, sometimes that involves rocking the boat, but it's how you rock the boat. Um, and so 15 year old Kayla <laughs> was um, on both extremes. <laughs> you know, sometimes I was like, oh, I don't want to start this argument. I don't want to deal with it today. And other times I was like, let me just tell you how wrong you are right. and why I'm right. And I'm going to win this argument because at the end of the day, that's what matters. And what I know today is that Facebook argument that I won or that debate I had in civics class when I was a senior in high school, it didn't matter. What mattered was the heart and the soul of the person behind that argument right. and that thing. And so I wish if I could go back, I would, I would change my entire, the way that I approached people um, and the way that I viewed people because I remember the moment that I, that I realized people who are different than me, um, who have different opinions than me are created in the image of the same God. I remember that um, so strongly, I was in Israel and there was a woman who, um, we, we visited her community, and uh, she was talking about how her community had been ravaged by attacks and bombs and mortars, and um, she was talking about how her son has really dealt with a lot of anxiety, and he, he has a lot of um, depression and things like that because of it. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, why does she stay here? Like, why do you stay here if you're going through all of this? And without even asking that question, I guess she knew we were thinking that. And she said, I stay here because one, this is the land that God promised my people. Mm -hmm. And two, I have always raised my son to know that there's a little boy on the opposite side of that border who has, who was created in the image of the same God we are. And when she said that, I just started to cry because I thought, I can't even look at the Democrats I serve with in the House of Delegates and feel that way about them. But here she is talking about people who, who truly want to kill her and her family as if she loves them and she cares for them. And I immediately began to repent and just ask God, you have to do this work in me because if I'm going to be an advocate for the kingdom, if I'm going to be an ambassador for Christ in this world, I'm going to have to have a shift in my mindset um, in the way that I approach people who I have disagreements <laughs> yeah, with. Yeah. If she can do it, right. then surely I can do it, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, so obviously uh, it, it, you're somebody who believes it's good for people to come together. Mm. You know, you learn so much by being around people who maybe are different from you, who have different experiences. Absolutely. And so I, I, I wonder, how do we do that? In this, in this fractured environment that we find ourselves in where, where Democrats and Republicans not only disagree, but they don't like each other. Yep. You know, how do we bring people together? <laughs> oh, you know, that is a question I get a lot, and it's a question I ask myself a lot. <laughs> and it's really interesting because there are people, even in my immediate family, who I have 
disagreements with yeah. on different issues. And at the end of the day, I want to be able to have dinner with them um, and without having to be so angry at them for, for disagreeing with me. And so I think, first of all, we have to approach it from a servant's heart. You keep, you keep saying public servant. And I think that is so important for us as believers to remember yeah. is we, ha we can have all these titles in the world. You can have, you can call me delegate. You can call me the honorable Kayla okay, Kessler. You can call me whatever you want. But ultimately at the heart of it, as a Christian, our title is servant. We're supposed to embody the personhood of Jesus. And it says that Jesus left heaven to become a servant, the lowliest of servants. He literally washed his disciples' feet. And so when I, when I first ran for office, um, a really good friend of mine gave me a towel. And she told me, I want you to keep this in your office to remind you that you are never too good to wash somebody's feet. Mm -hmm. If Jesus can wash his disciples' feet, then you can wash the feet of people who attack you, who, uh, who disagree with you. You have to have that servant's heart now. Don't get me wrong. I have my days where I'm like, Jesus, you got to, uh, you are do. vexing my soul. We all do. <laughs> so, Jesus, you got to do that something for we me. All do. And, um, but I'm learning so quickly that if I, if we as believers are going to build bridges instead of walls, we can't attack somebody and then tell them about Jesus yeah. and think that they're going to, uh, you know, it's the old adage, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Yeah. And it's so true. If we want to build the kingdom, you know, I, I always say, let's make heaven crowded. And if we're going to make heaven crowded, then you can't go around with a chip on your shoulder thinking everybody who disagrees with you is the enemy. And guess what? There are probably things that you and I firmly believe is truth today that in a year we're going to say, you know what? I was probably wrong on that. Like there's there's some room to grow. And so I think keeping that humble spirit and going uh, and approaching people prayerfully um, you know, even just this morning as I was getting ready, um, I was feeling the pressure because we're running a little bit behind. And um, it, coming out of the hotel, the, uh, the cleaning lady had, had sort of left her cart right in the center of the thing. And I felt myself like, why didn't yeah. she just pull that over there? And then immediately I was like, I just have to pray for her. I have to pray for her. And I did. And I just began to say, God, bless her. I hope that you give her a day, that an easy day. I hope that you will just bless her and her family. And immediately God begins to change our hearts. When we let mercy flow from our hearts, God begins to mend them. God begins to heal them. Amen. Well, uh, we are so glad to have you on the show today. And, and for all of you listening at home, I hope that you will let mercy flow from your heart as well. And you'll take a page out of the book of Kayla Kessinger to have love for the people around you and to have a servant's heart. May God bless you and tune in again next time for the State of Independence. God bless you. Thank you so much yeah. for having oh, no, thank me. Thank you. You were wonderful. Oh my gosh, you're this wonderful. has been you're, really you're, fun. Your, your words were wonderful and a blessing. I just prayed this morning as we were driving here that uh, God would use uh, all these conversations this morning just for His glory. Absolutely. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.